All right, guys, before we get into this episode, I just want to let you guys know that in the bio below will be a link to win our nice Sog Green Yeti here. You can win it at our Earth Day event on April 21st from 4.30 to 7 here at Sod Metal Recycling. Thank you, guys. All right, what's up, guys? Good morning. Back here, back in the dumpster for another episode of our Dumpster Talks. We got some uh, special guests here. We've been waiting for you guys. <laughs> Come to check out the yard and uh, do this with us. So we have Pablo and Phil. They're here with Compass Metals. Um, right now, how we know them, Dan introduces to them. They're some of our brokers, buy our aluminum, um, get some of these cans, <laughs> whatever the price is right. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, we just wanted to have you guys on. Come check out the place and uh, yeah, get you on the dumpster talk. So well, we appreciate you being here, and uh, you know it's always a it's always a good time coming out and visiting yeah. with you guys. You know, is this your guys' first? Uh, have you been on a podcast before? Or no, no. I've listened to many podcasts. <laughs> yeah. I've been, I was bugging Kerry since the last time we came to get me to get me on, and I think yeah, he was like, once we get through a hundred guests, then we'll <laughs> bottom of the barrel. We'll get you guys on. So yeah, you guys glad to be here, guys. Best for last, yeah, for sure. Um, but if you guys just want to kind of start. Um, Given some background about uh, kind of how you guys got here today. Sure. Um, so, uh, just a little bit of background: Compass Metal Trading, based in, in Sewell, New Jersey. Uh, so we're a brokerage company. Uh, I started the business in 2013. I worked in the scrap industry for eight years uh, in the Toronto area, originally from Canada, for Combined Metal Industries. And uh, at that time, I was I, I worked in operations trading, and I was actually running a yard for them. Um, and I decided to move to the U.S. because I met a uh, girl who is now my wife, and I tried to get her to move to, to Canada, and I failed very badly. Um, so I ended up deciding I was going to move to the U.S., and I went to our CEO, Gary Kaplan, and just said, hey, here's my plan. Um, I gave him six months kind of notice, and instead of, you know, my plan was to, to quit and start over. Uh, and he said, hey, instead of doing that, why don't you put together a little business plan? and uh, we want to be in business with you so go down and figure it out so um, i started july 2013 and the idea was just to broker aluminum because i knew that world and i chose aluminum over copper because it's cheaper and i'm not super smart but i figured if i'm gonna make a small margin i'd rather pay less for the material yeah. um, so i just literally started 2013 driving around going to yards um, and, and just trying to pick up business uh, by myself, working from home. Tough road at the beginning, because when you come into places, people aren't dying to sell you material. You've got people they already deal with. Uh, took some time, we built up. Um, we had a, another trader that joined the company in 2017, Matt Newman out of Michigan. And uh, him and I kind of grew the business up and then we've just organically just grown it by bringing on really good traders around the country, uh, focusing on aluminum, giving them opportunities to do their thing. That's when. Phil came on in 2020. We have Scott Corson in Kentucky. Uh, last year, Jonathan Shin came on in California and a D Haven in the Carolinas. So the back office is in New Jersey. We've got traders spread out across the country. Um, and we're and we're really uh, right now doing about eight to 10 million pounds of aluminum a month um, and just trying to grow, just trying to change. It really started as a domestic business. Now we've gotten a lot of overseas stuff going, direct shipping cool. into Europe. Uh, into Asia, and really what we do is we go out, uh, there's two sides to it, there's you know, the selling, there's some traders that focus more on the selling side, and some on the, on the, on the procurement, on the buying side. And what we try to do is go out to yards like you guys and build relationships, kind of become your marketing department. Yeah. Uh, so you wanna come out and make your life easy. Uh, the way we look at it is you don't have, you're running a, a yard, or if, if it's Dan, um, he doesn't have time every day to see who's got the best price on MLC, what's the spec here try to make life easy. So a lot of times it's just figuring out, coming to suppliers that trust you and, and giving them options. What can I do with this, what can I do with that? That's our job. And, and then on the back end, what, what the suppliers don't see is like, someone like Phil's getting offers, bringing them to our sales team. We're working, okay, what can go here? We've got this position there, we, we figure it all out. And then, I mean, the other part of it, which is not the sexiest part, is people use us a little bit like a bank because what's happened over time um, and we're seeing it even more with rates going up and up on, on the cost of money is, is these mills have widened their terms. 
It used to be everyone paid on 30 days, now it's 45 days. So mm -hmm. as brokers, we offer quicker terms. So, you know, some people, they might know exactly where it's going, but they need that cash flow to keep it going. So that, that's kind of our business in a nutshell. Yeah. Uh, we've got a bunch of exciting stuff going on as far as growth, but I'll let Phil introduce himself because I don't want to talk the whole time. Well, thank you. Um, so uh, again, my name is Phil. I'm from uh, Highland Park, New Jersey, right outside of Rutgers, New Brunswick. Um, I got into scrap metal. I, I came out of actually the restaurant industry. Uh, I worked in the restaurant industry for roughly 10 sub odd years and basically, um, you know, did everything and everything from washing dishes to scooping ice cream to, you know, cleaning tables, serving people, making your drinks and, uh, you know, overall, you know, floor management. So um, it was a, it was a great experience and I've been able to transfer that over to um, scrap metal in terms of overall customer service. Um, you know, finding out what somebody needs um, because obviously a, a hungry diner, you know, they're not in the uh, they're not the most, you know, friendly person, let's say, when they, they want to eat something. So, what are you um, saying about scrap dollars? <laughs> <laughs> that being said, um, uh, I, I actually got my start in scrap. I worked for a small brokerage company based out of uh, New Jersey. Um, a buddy of mine that I went to high school with, um, you know, actually got my start. I uh, said, you know, you're, you're doing sales. I think you'd be great at this. He already knew that I was really good at, um, you know, uh, buying and selling off of the internet. And I was a handy person, really good at, uh, you know, working on things. Um, I had a, you know, I had this kind of, you know, hands-on mentality. So he said, you know, you should give this a shot. Uh, I was very successful, uh, except there was one stipulation in terms of the first uh, gig. It was uh, brokerage for uh, the German and uh, European Union market. Oh, wow. So it's a little bit different. Yep, it was uh, some early hours in the office, basically trying to reach people in Germany. Um, and did you my, learn German for it or no? It's a great question. I did do Rosetta Stone while I was there. <laughs> um, but no, uh, the good thing about the German market, despite I call them gatekeepers, uh, people that you're receiving, obviously, in the yard, you know, the, the woman who's picking up or the man who's picking up in the uh, in the front office, English is their second language. So they are, you know, as long as you're able to connect with them and, you know, uh, build the rapport that way, eventually you can get through the door to the to the right uh, point in contact. So I was able to establish that business pretty good um, from there. You know, uh, again, I'm, I'm a very hands on kind of person, so I didn't. I didn't know the aspect of scrap. And I think that that for some buyers out there, I think that that, um, you know, that they're definitely lacking on it. So what I found to do, um, I actually got into operations. I had the, uh, I had the opportunity to work in a yard. Um, I worked for a, a, a smaller um, two yard uh, feeder facility, let's call it, um, basically focused on non-ferrous and ferrous buying for them. Um, from there, I went to a, a medium sized shredder up in Northern Jersey. Um, became their non-ferrous manager there uh, in terms of purchasing as well as marketing um, their non-ferrous materials coming out of the shredder as well as for uh, industrial and peddler accounts. And then from there, I went to a larger operation, um, the biggest in the world. We don't need to mention names, but um, had my experience of working in one of their mega shredders here in, here in the East Coast and uh, really just opened up my eyes and you know, um, overall gave me the experience that a lot of people, again, just don't have in terms of handling the material, processing the material, you know, knowing how to upgrade, um, and then also kind of knowing the woes of the business. You know, yeah. scrap metal is a very tough business. It's, it's hard on your body. It's, it's hard on everything. So um, that really gives me uh, an understanding of my customers and what they're going through. Um, and also the ability to work through that and work around, let's say, maybe a problem that they may be having so that I can, you know, work from there to, you know, better accommodate them. Sure. Going back to like you guys coming up through like school and stuff, did you have any like aspirations or any like idea at all of uh, like what the scrap industry was or did you kind of like, uh, what so, was your original plans like going? Yeah, like, yeah, like, that's a good school? question. So we, so I did a business degree and uh, I'm the youngest of four kids and everyone in my family did business degrees and everyone worked for big companies. My brother's a, a banking, my eldest sister's in pharmaceuticals and my other sister is in uh, packaged goods and, and marketing. And uh, I, I did not know at all. What I, what I kind of did is, when I came out of school, um, I did my first interview and I thought, okay, I'll, this will be easy. And I, and I did terrible. <laughs> it was just really, I did really bad. So my, my one sister, Sophia, uh, just said, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll help you. You'll get good at interviews. 
use. That's how, that's the first step. Shout she, out to Sophia. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she like helped me. And what I did was I just started taking interviews everywhere. I didn't care what the job was. I'm like, I'm just gonna get good at interviews. And so it, when I did the interview for, for combined metal industries, I didn't, I didn't even know what I was interviewing for. It was with a recruiter and, uh, I, I was just like, okay, I did well in the interview and I ended up meeting their, uh, meeting the CEO, Gary Kaplan. And I just like, we had like a three hour conversation where I was like, geez, I like this guy. Yeah. And I don't know what this is, but I like it. Um, so I ended up kind of in a, in a, in a fork in the road where, you know, I had an opportunity with them and, and I had done probably 12 hours worth of interviews with them, like the whole trading team with the VP, they took it really seriously. Uh, and their idea was, you learn from the ground up, you, you work in operations and that's how you learn. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'd, I'd grown up, um, like where I grew up, there's a lot of manufacturing. So a lot of the summers I would work, um, my parents, I didn't have, I, I didn't grow up with an allowance. Shout out to my parents. <laughs> so I would just like, if I wanted money, I would just have to go and work. So a lot of, th in the summers I would work, I worked at factories. I mean, yep. that's what there was in our yep. town. There's a lot of factories, so sweep floors, I'd run equipment, you'd be like the fill-in guy. So I was like, all right, well, I can do that. So. Um, I decided I had two opportunities, one with a very big, very corporate thing. And, and at the time I was 23 and, uh, you know, I talked to my parents about it, who both totally not scrap related at all. And, yeah. you know, their, their thing was like, Hey, you're 23 years old. If you don't like it, you can just quit and do something else. <clears throat> um, so I, I took the, I took the leap and, uh, I started an operations. I was supposed to be there for two months, which is what most of the traders did. They had just bought their first HRB bailer needed someone to run it so they're like hey can you just do this so it was, it was kind of cool so i ended up working in operations for a year but i mean going into it i had no idea and one of the things i loved about the industry right away and i'm sure you guys see it is a lot of our customers like at that time it was more than buying from dealers we were buying you know industrial customers so just going out and seeing every episode it was like an episode of how it's made like you just mm -hmm. all these industries you had no idea even existed it was so neat to to be a part of it so yeah for me it, it just it just clicked um you know along the way i've had friends in the industry that they come in, they try it. And for whatever reason, it doesn't, it doesn't click for me. It just, it just worked. And uh, yeah, yeah. I, did a, I did a LinkedIn post last week, like about how like this, this industry kind of has a way, like it started for me and Carrie as a summer job. And then now we just kind of started learning more about it. And you just kind of want to get more hands on with it. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I th again, it's, I think it's really specific. Like I remember living with, with, with my friends out of university and, they all had more kind of corporate jobs and I would come home and I would just be like, like covered in whatever. And, and they would just be like, what, what do you do? Like, what is this job? And, and I mean, whatever, it just, I, for me, it took and for, it doesn't for everybody. And it made sense to me. I thought it was cool. I think there's a ton of opportunity um, in the industry. And, and I, I kind of like the idea of like, you know, you can go and work in a kind of flashy industry, but if you find this kind of niche thing, yeah. um, I think there's a lot of opportunity in it. And would you say like, um, would you just advise a lot of like kids when they're younger, like you said, even 23, um, you just take that opportunity and see what comes of it. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's what it is. And I mean, Phil said, said it, I think one of the things that we look for with traders, especially is if you have operations experience and you understand how things work in a yard, um, it's great. Um, just, I mean, I think it's whether it's scrap or something else, you just got to go and yeah. try stuff. I think one of the, one of the struggles is that, I mean, you guys know you're much younger than us is, yeah. is when you're growing up, you don't even know, yeah. you know, you know, like five jobs. I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of the way it is. You're, you're trained of like, these are the things that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's good to just go out and try stuff. And worst case, if you don't like it, you can try something else. Sure. It's not, it's not yeah, the end of true. the world. But I, yeah, I mean, I think it's a great thing if you can, if you can find someone. I know there's a lot of people that, that are doing what you guys do on social media, trying to push young people um, into trying the scrap industry. I think there's just, a lot of opportunity that the future is bright and, and recycling and i think we just gotta we just gotta get people trying it and it's not gonna stick for everybody that's for sure but yeah. mm -hmm. i mean for those that that do it it works yeah, yeah sure did, yeah. Phil, did it stick with you right away as well or or kind of took some time to get used to it well i mean first i had no real understanding of what scrap metal really was you know it was kind of like this is a sales opportunity let's let's kind of learn as you go you know coming out of college you basically you know, not everybody really has that kind of clear line of sight to say like, okay, I want to be a lawyer or everything. You know, I also yeah. had a, I, ha I also had a business management degree and I was like, you know, I was coming out of the restaurant business and the restaurant business is also, it's a tough beast. You know, those hours are very long for, for people. Um, 
so no, you know, when, when I came in, you know, coming from Jersey, you know, you see the Goodfellas and, you know, the, the traditional, <laughs> you know, like, uh, risk ris yeah, right. Uh, waste management guys. And it's completely skewed. Um, and then, uh, the reality of it is, you know, I, I think what, what kind of opened my eyes was that um, the United States, as well as the entire world, has a very big problem with, you know, closing the loop, um, sustainability and making sure that we're actually doing our part to um, make sure that we're um, recycling the material correctly. And I think that even here in the United States, I think a lot of that, um, there's still a lot of, you know, miseducation as well as, you know, um, people not knowing the, the, the precise way to do it. So, um, you know, I, I, I think it was, um, I think it was, a, a, an opportunity for me to basically, you know, learn something new, um, that, you know, I would appreciate doing. And now it has stuck 100%. And like Pablo said, you know, um, once you're in, I, I give, you know, I tell people basically, if you can, if you can last a year, you're in it for life. You know, and it's such a it's such a niche and unique um, industry that it, it really will take you take care of you and, and your family, which is extremely important. I have a question mm -hmm. now. Can you go into depth of what a metal broker is for people that may not know? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so so long and short of it is we work as a middleman between suppliers and mills. Mm -hmm. um, and there's like I said before, there's different reasons that people use brokers. Um, but really, it, you know, a lot of times it's, it's kind of an economy of scale where, you know, we're taking positions at mills. So if you go to sell, you know, we were talking about painted siding. If you go to sell one load of painted siding, you're not going to get the same price as us that we're selling 20 loads. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we kind of facilitate in between. And on top of for this isn't for every broker, but for us, you know, we try to be full service and providing trucking, making it simple. So it's like, hey, truck shows up, I load it. I don't have to worry about um, anything else. I send my paperwork. And life goes on. So we kind of we work as a middleman between the two. Again, there's different reasons people use us. Sometimes it's for information. Sometimes we've got a better price mm -hmm. than the mill that they can get directly from the mill. Or sometimes they might say, like we've done some open deals with people where like they know what we're making. There's no secret, mm -hmm. and it's just like, hey, you know, to run my business, I need <coughs> cash in, you know, 14 days. I need these terms, and that's it. So we're really working in between, and we're just doing deals between two parties at all times. Sometimes it's it's spot business where we're literally, someone will come to us and say, I've got this item, can you help me market it? Yep. And sometimes it's it's items that we already have positions at Mills and it's as simple as just like filling the positions and yep. just, you know, what we try to do as part of part of our uh, our service is, is our traders are out on the road a lot. So we go to visit people, um, understand their businesses, try to get, you know, their, like Phil was saying, their pain points, how we can help them. Um, and also, you know, helps us to know we're dealing with good suppliers and, and good people, but that's that's really it. We work we work as middlemen between two parties, um, and we just provide the service of, of helping you move your metal. Yeah, thank you. Um, how how important do you think um, building connections with like businesses oh, and stuff is? Huge. Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent huge. You know, um, I, th I think you know some people are a little bit more closed-minded to new new business, and the reality of being a broker um, or being a buyer is that we're here to help. Um, we're here to basically you know, help you out with a situation and look at it from a standpoint that you might not see. You might see it, you know, singularly, like I've been selling to this guy for let's say 20 odd years and he's my guy, which is all good and good and fine. But you're also not looking at it from a business standpoint of, you know, there are other opportunities where there might be consumers elsewhere that would be paying a premium for, for said, you know, material. Um, yeah. So, so my brother-in-law who works in, in tech, he always like used to ask me, he's like, I don't understand you guys. You're trading commodities. Why can't you just get on a platform, like on a computer? Like, what is the point of you guys existing? Which never makes you feel great, but it's a fair question because yeah. I think what it comes down to is, um, I mean, there's so many, you guys know, there's so many nuances in this business as far as like, I don't know, you look at a certain package of material of aluminum of like an old sheet, this one that's different than that one. Um, so building that relationship and having someone that understands is so important um, and also the truth of it is if you deal with anybody in this business long enough, you're going to run into problems. I mean, that's that's unfortunate, but that's the reality. So I think the relationship really comes in is because you want somebody that like kind of is your friend in the way of like, you know that, hey, if something goes wrong, like they're going to help me out and we're going to figure it out together. So we, we really based our whole growth on, on relationships. Like we really don't want to be a company that's just 
throwing out price lists day in and day out. In the end, it's a commodity. Um, yeah. And we, we see it, those prices get bounced around everywhere. What we want is we want, we want to become the people in, in the different areas where suppliers are calling us saying, hey, we need this. It's not that we're not going to send price. Obviously, we need to help and because it also helps our suppliers know where the market's at. But right. we, we want to be able to have that co those conversations, like give them different options. So like this morning, I got a call from somebody saying I've got, you know, a, a split load of siding and MLC. What can I do with it? Now it's talking about, um, OK, is it bailed? Is it boxed? Um, can you do straight loads and hold a little bit longer because you can get a better price if you do straight loads? I've got export options on this. I can, you know, it's like you got to talk through it. If I just sent the guy a price, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't mean anything. So building yeah. that relationship and him trusting that I have, you know, that I that I'm not going to set him up for failure either. I I know there. I, I know his material. I've been there. Mm -hmm. He knows I understand what their quality is. So I, I'm not going to put him in a position. That it's like he's going to send it somewhere. He's going to have an automatic issue. So I mean, I think for us anyway, the relationships have been have been key and, and Mason, I was saying to you before is, mm -hmm. is you know, we, we've got the luxury where we're a small group, there's, there's 12 of us in our group, um, but we're also, you know, our parent company is a much bigger company, four or 500 people, but we've yep. got the flexibility where, you know, our traders, um, you know, if Phil wants to go do a deal, you know, he can go do deals and he mm -hmm. can he can do things that make sense for their customers and, and his customers know that he's got, you know, he's, he's able to go and trade and use his relationships to go and go and do things. There's not a lot of red tape. So right. that's kind that's of the way nice. we built it. And, and I think that's one of the things a lot of our suppliers have told us that they appreciate that, you know, we're not this big corporate entity that they can, that they can actually talk to people. And that goes all the way down to our, you know, our logistics team that they, you know, they know they can make a phone call. They know the person they can, you know, they can talk. And I think as we grow, it's, it's one of the challenges is to try to keep that feeling, but that's, that's like the, that's the key to the, the key to our success so far. And I think that's what we don't want to lose. Yeah, awesome. it's basically like it really is based on trust mm -hmm. because like when you do a deal, like especially like you're selling these bales or any any load you're selling out, like I know when Dan, I, I've seen him like over the past couple of years when he does a deal, like he's constantly thinking if it's going to go through or like if there's a lot of stuff that has to go right after you send, yeah. the, send it out. So. You have to until the until the scrap that. actually delivers, gets off the truck. It's like that's right. You, yeah. you you theoretically like sometimes we'll do a good deal and we're like oh great, but until it yeah. until it delivers, it's good to have that good relationship though. And like you guys come out here a good bit, and it's good to like because mm -hmm. like it's easy to set the price sheet out, but right. it's good to like actually have a relationship absolutely with the person and, and see the material. See the on. see the material. Walk the yard. Talk to you guys about what's going on, you know. So like we're, we're real people. We're not just the exactly. guys that stare at a, com at a computer. You know, we've been through it all. We, we, we know the problems and, you know, we want to, you know, help you guys out as best as we I possibly like can. I that's a bad thing in our industry. Like, we're not looked at as, like, not, not looked at as people, but, like, kind of, like, looked down upon and, like, this is, like, a dead-end job. But, like, there's a lot of opportunity. For sure. That's just not even really talked about. I think I think the I think it's changing. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, and yeah. look I, again, credit to you guys. And there's a lot of people out there doing really good stuff on social media, which I think this industry like needs because we're so far behind on it. But yeah, there's definitely that idea of like the the junkyard kind right. of yeah. thing so that we've got to get willing to like change because I know a lot of scrapyards like even when we started doing the video stuff here, they're like, where are you going? Right. Like, mm -hmm. Videos at a scrapyard, but. Getting it in front of not everyone's gonna come to a scrapyard. Like I grew up in Columbia my whole life. Mm -hmm. I never knew this place was it like this big. Yeah, I live across the street. I didn't even know this was here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good to just get like get it out in front of the people. It's funny. Yeah. It's one of those businesses too. Like we say to people when when, when we hire them, um, you don't know it's around, and then you can't ignore it. You see it mm -hmm. everywhere. You yep. know, like I'm sure you guys when you're driving on the you highway, stare at trucks. Oh, you see, yeah. you're like, oh, there's <laughs> that <laughs> truck. Yeah. It's, the dumps, I'm always looking for dumps. Uh, the world always looking at dumps, yeah. roll offs. Yeah. It makes you feel more comfortable, like comfortable too, kind of like where you live. Because like a lot of these places, I didn't know like what they did. Like I went up mm -hmm. with Michael. We all actually went up with Michael to steal him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And it's cool to like actually see like all the steel we're torching or recycling. It's actually getting put into a melting pot and making stuff. It's yeah. just actually cool to, to see. You're part of something bigger. Yep. Yeah. Does sound like, cheesy, but yeah. yeah. Which is going to be a much bigger, bigger role coming coming here. You know, in the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. You know, yeah. like it's it's sustainability. It's definitely not going away. That's that's exactly it. You know. Yeah. What kind of I guess to branch off a little bit from the the metal side. What what would you say is or it still is dealing with metal. What's like the biggest difference? For you, Phil, of um, like working in your old industry to now, and kind of what 
Was there one specific thing that made you make that change? Uh, well, I mean, you know, the restaurant business is, is you're, you're dealing with people, you know, who are essentially hungry. Uh, everybody's going to have to wait. I mean, you know, in, in regards to, you know, there, there, there is a waiting period, you know, essentially for appointments nowadays or, you know, finding, you know, prompt, prompt and getting people, you know, let's say fed. Um, it, it, it's two different beasts. I mean, you know, the, the restaurant business versus the recycling business. Um, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's too hard to compare. Yeah. I guess I guess. Would be hard yeah. To compare. Um, what we're, we're really, you know, kind of as similar is, you know, how, how you're able to interact with people, let's say, and be able to communicate, uh, but also find what that person needs. Um, and again, you know, supply them with those needs, you know, in a timely fashion that they're also going to be happy, um, that they enjoy their experience and that they keep coming back. That's, that's the bigger thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask about, so you guys, you said you originally got into aluminum, like that was the main thing you guys were training. Mm -hmm. How did, so you decided to do that because it was like the cheaper metal kind of and like, yeah, I mean, I, I really, that? I really like, I really knew that side of the business better. Um, you know, that our parent company, I, I just dealt with a lot of more aluminum. I didn't know the red metal side as much. Okay. Um, so it was kind of an easier fit. When I look back, I had actually never done any selling. So like I literally came and I was like, and, and by the way, this is the way I've kind of done things through my whole scrap career, very sink or swim. So like, I still remember the first deal I did. I lost uh, about $2,000 on it oh, when wow. I moved here. And it was like, cause I, I just I was learning. Um, mm -hmm. So I knew aluminum, but I, I didn't really know the end user. So that was the, the big learning curve. But I just, I, I at least knew, you know, knew the grades, kind of understood it. Um, in hindsight, I wish I would learn the other side a little bit cause it took me longer, but yeah, it was just kind of what made sense. Uh, we started doing some other stuff now in the business and we have a small uh, business that we do like, um, we process range lead that okay. we do remelt. It's like a small kind of side business that we own the majority of. Um, so we've gotten into a couple other things and then we're working on a couple of op other opportunities, but aluminum is just what's made the most sense. Um, and then the last year or so, <coughs> you know, we've, we've done more and more with our parent company uh, cause they built this, this beautiful, um, you know, 200 and, I don't know, 250,000 square feet. Um, Non-Ferris facility in Toronto, which I mean. Oh, wow. So this is CMI? This is CMI. Right. And, and at some point, you guys, I mean, that's, it's, it's. I mean, I would say it's the nicest uh, scrap facility. I would, I would, I'd say North America. I don't want to, I want to, you know, go so too much on the record. There? That's, well, I'm just saying the invite's there. <laughs> uh, no, but so, so one of the things that we've been doing is, is also like, uh, and Phil's been doing a lot of this is, is they're, they're huge buyers on, on, on mixed loads, right. especially really strong on, on coppers and brasses. Uh, so he's, he's been doing a lot of that, we've been pulling a lot of material into there because I mean, they, they, they buy almost uh, almost 20 million pounds through that facility of mono. Yeah. So it's a, it's a behemoth. So that, that's that been kind of one of the things in the last year that we've, you know, as they've grown and we've started growing, we also said, hey, this this doesn't make sense. We're not gonna run in, like, let's let's work together. Right. So, you know, we're separate as companies, but we're, we're also doing a lot of trading together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you guys mostly do like straight loads as well, or like you said split? Yeah. So so it's been historically mostly straight loads. Like we'll do like we'll do you know depending on on what it is and a lot of secondary stuff. You can do two or three items. Um, you know sometimes the price is better. Like right now we were talking about before to go back to it. Siding's like something that everyone's kind of looking for. So straight loads of siding and you can get a nice premium. If it's a split load and it's going with something else, the way the market's gone, um, you know if you want to put MLC on there. Some mills don't want it, so you're not going to get as good a price. Yeah. And then, and then Phil's been working a lot, doing doing a lot of mixed loads up to our, our parent company, which has worked out pretty nicely. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you, you guys work with mills a lot and stuff, right? What is like that process like of working with like a mill like that? Do you, like the people out there that don't really know. How yeah, I mean, it's it's really um, it's it's like any other I think any other business relationship. You got to build trust. Um, okay. So you, you usually are, you know, you, we, we've gone out to almost all the mills that, that we deal with because, you know, like we talk, going in person means a lot. Mm -hmm. um, we go to these conventions, these scrap conventions, which, again, is funny for people that are in the industry to think that we have these conventions that we talk about scrap. Yeah. But it's a real thing, as you guys know. <laughs> um, and really, it's, it's just, you know, it's the same thing. It's like we build we build relationships with them. We build trust. You know, you're not going into a mill and that you've never dealt with and saying, hey, I want to sell you. A million pounds right off the bat. You start mm -hmm. slow. You build a relationship. You prove yourself. Um, you show them that 
same thing as with, with suppliers. Mm -hmm. If something goes wrong, we're going to deal with it properly. Yeah. In that case, it means that if you take an order and something gets rejected, you fulfill it. Um, if there's a problem, you, you deal with it properly. If there's a safety concern, you make sure it's addressed with the supplier um, that you're, you know, they, they know that you're taking the time to do these kind of sorts of things, going out and making sure that your suppliers know the specs, know the safety issues. I mean, that's really it. It's really just building, building trust. And then what we found is like, you know, if a mill buyer leaves somewhere and we've got a relationship, he goes to another mill, you know, they already, they know us, they know our company and it, and it goes, goes a long way because it's you know you built up that reputation so mm -hmm. it's really really important because there's only so many end users um, yeah. so so the, your reputation is everything and that's why you know some brokers get we don't we don't we try to get if someone gets a rejected load I mean we're not gonna get mad I mean, we just have to figure it out with you mm -hmm. now the truth of it is if you have rejection after rejection after rejection nobody's gonna want to buy from you because it's not good for anybody but yeah. but it's that same thing it's just building building over time um, and then learning how they do things when we hire our, our back office staff one of the things we tell them is it's very hard because we deal with all these different end users yeah. and they all do things their own way they have different portals that you have to go on we can't go to them and say well this is the way we want it we have to just adjust so it's like teaching someone like okay if it goes here you have to log on to their portal that's where you get the weights for here you go to this person and this is how they do it so it's it's different every, it's, every it's different every time which okay. makes it fun but also makes it hard to train somebody because it's not easy. It's not, it's not any jobs in this, in this business. And again, you guys know, you're never gonna have boring days. You come yeah. in every day is an adventure. It doesn't matter what part of the industry you're in, it's always different. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just kind of how it is. So yeah, so we just try to like teach, our, uh, teach everyone um, how important it is on our staff, like that we deal with mills in a proper way. We build that relationship. They ask you a question, you get back to them. If, they need to know when a truck's coming in. You got to be quick on on these sorts of things, and just think of it as like customer service um, on both sides. Yeah. Who you're buying from and who you're selling to. Yep. You just got to give good customer service both ways. Yep. It's a good kind of um, off track. Uh, we're all like 20. Mason's a little older. Um, <laughs> what, what advice would you give yourself at 20? By the way, stage? Mason is 27. So that's why. <laughs> yeah. like I'm like, I'm like, make him feel yeah. pretty old here. You know, they're like, ah, I'm so older. <laughs> Stick with it. That's what I would say. I mean, if you're you're set for life as long. I mean, you guys have already made it past the threshold, in my opinion. Um, you know, it's very rewarding at the end of the day. Uh, you know, do you have your ups? Yeah. Do you come in in the morning and your trucks won't start, or you you bust a line, or you know, blow a cylinder or something like that? Yeah, it's gonna happen. But that's just the business. You get it to the shop. You have it swapped out. Have it rebuilt. Move on, and then find out, figure out a plan with your boys, and just move on. That's it. Find out a plan. Keep coming up. Put your boots on every morning. Keep coming to work. Yes, I, I would say one thing that seems like you guys do that's really important is is I think it's an industry where you need to have no ego um, and just be willing to do whatever. I mean, that's when I was young. When I was a young buck like you guys, <laughs> um, you know, I, I ran a yard at a very young age. I think I, I was running the yard at 25, um, and and. I mean, I would I would do what I had to do. Like I was saying to you guys before, I would run the scale house by myself on Saturdays. I mean, we would rotate who did it, um, but I was willing to do anything, anything that I that I needed to do. You just you, you don't. It's not an industry where you kind of say like that's not my job. Like I think to be successful in this industry, and, and my advice to anybody in the industry is just be willing to help wherever you can, mm -hmm. because everything you do just helps you learn. You know, like if it's doing paperwork for a truck going out to a mill, you kind of learn how it goes. So then if you're loading the truck, you understand what that person is going through. Sure. Every every piece of it, it's like a piece of a puzzle in this industry. So sure. every little thing that you do is, is super helpful. And I think to this day, I, I think it's important. Like we try to have people on our team that are just willing to help each other. Mm -hmm. and, and again, take the ego out of it. Like you're here to just, everyone's got the same goal. Like we're, you know, we just want to get our jobs done and and uh, have a little fun, hopefully. And that's it. I like that point that you made because you can't really like, you can't get your feelings hurt kind of in this industry because like some of the ways stuff can come across is we don't mean it at the end of the day so you kind of just have to I mean it's nice here because we're all we're all friends pretty much before we came here to work like Alex started working here for our family then we all started coming slowly so but I mean that that it's funny because I've 
I've gone down that road before. And that's that's good that you guys can keep the relationship because that's not always easy either. Yeah. Because like sometimes it's easier if someone that you know not in your personal life yeah. that you can like have a little bit of a blow up or whatever. So it's good if you guys can, can manage that. <laughs> we still end up. We might go through some hard days during the week, but we still hang out every yeah. weekend. So every day. <laughs> that's valuable. Would you, say, would you say you like right now? Do you work with any of like your family or anything, or is it hard to, or would you say like? Just strictly like people that you never, you don't know. Like, uh, I mean, look. I think what what happens is you, you become, kind of, you, become yeah. you become like I don't, I don't, I, always, I never like the thing of like you become family because I'm like I always <laughs> like think it's like a little bit like I, I like a like the sounds toxic to be like we're a family right but like yeah. in the end the, everyone you work with becomes your friend mm -hmm. like I, I I say to my to my wife like I moved to the U S when I was thirty right mm -hmm. I'm not and I had kids like two years after I'm not making I'm not out making new friends. 32 like my, my friends are the people I work with yeah. a lot of times because I'm like that that's like the joke like yep. like she always says because like those are the people you spend your time with um so you want to enjoy the people that you work with I mean it's not your family it's not the same as your family but at the same time it's like yeah it's I don't know you build you build friendships as far as like actual family for me it's a no but like that's because our family like is in different worlds um, I wouldn't want to do it I, I I love what we like what we built and I don't know that I would be, like even even with friends this point i would be nervous i think again mm -hmm. kudos to you guys i mean definitely for certain people else. yeah and i'm sure you i'm sure i don't know how, if your friends watch this but i'm sure you don't have to shut them out but i'm sure you, you know there's people that maybe want to get in that you'd be like hey, maybe not. <laughs> uh, but yeah i mean i think i think we just like we're, we, we're on the phone all the time like mm -hmm. phil's one of the first people i talk to you know every morning you know like so like you become you become friends it's just yeah. part of part of life and you spend so much time together that like you're with the people you work with. Like, the people you work with, you're with them more than you're like. Yeah, well, you're, that's mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's true. It's very true. Kind of a choice, like, if you want to get along with them, you don't want to. Well, Phil and I will be like, we'll both be logged in doing work on like a Saturday night, and like we both see each other on Teams, but we don't want to admit that we're doing work on Saturday night. you will be like, I saw you on. Like, Why are you greenlit right now? <laughs> Stop working. Stop sending emails. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what would you guys say? Like, we we're talking about how obviously there's like some stuff that doesn't always go perfect um, every day. What do you think, kind of? What do you think like drives you to get up in the morning and still keep going at it? Is it I feel you? Or, I don't think anything. I don't think any business is going to go right. I think it's yeah. just. I think it's just the nature of business in general. Yeah. I mean, you know, whether we're you know in manufacturing, whether we're in recycling, or whether we're in you know the restaurant business, no matter what something is going to go wrong and that's we have adopted that uh, responsibility to do the job gotta persevere persevere yeah. make a plan work with the people that you like working with and figure out the goal and and you know have a good result yeah i mean it's it's not a like we said it's not a perfect science there's going to be things that go wrong i mean sometimes when we get stressed i mean i'll, I'll say to phil it's like we're just trading scrap yep. like in the end and yeah. then, we can we can make it this big thing, um, but it's just scrap metal. Just, that's it. That's and so it. like all we can do is is you know is just try to try to work with with good people, get through it. Um, and of course you're gonna have experiences where where you say hey you walk away and you're probably not doing business with that person again. That that's not great. I mean, but it happens. Um, and so you just you just try to try to get through it. And what we try to do is just you know when that kind of stuff comes up, the problems come up. Yeah. You just try to be open with people, talk through the situation, try to figure out the best result and and move on. Unfortunately, you know, there's another problem coming at some point. So you just mm -hmm. got to just got to keep keep moving and, and know like I mean, what Phil is saying, like I've been in this industry since I finished university. So I, I sometimes will ask my friends, like, are your industries this hard? Like, because like, like we deal with it, we do deal with a lot. But yeah. I mean, again, it's yeah. it's it's just scrap metal um, and everyone's just trying to do their best and we just got to get through it yeah. and you're saying like um you're saying pablo that you have a wife at home and i wasn't sure i do i'm 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 married to my wonderful wife rachel i have two yeah. two little children vanessa and madison that's good and madison's gonna be five oh, in, uh, right. in, a, in a month so so how do you guys kind of like on the like rough days how do you kind of like bring it back in and not not take, take it home out? yeah i guess um, you, you, you know, it's, you just shut it off, you know, that's the reality of it. You know, what you, what happens at work, you know, whether it's a good day or a bad day is, is, 
you know, on you to basically make sure that you're not taking home your work and yeah. that you're spending the time that you have with them. Uh, it's valuable. It's one of the reasons why I decided to come on with Pablo. I mean, he's a very, he's very understanding. He's a very family oriented man. He gets it. He knows that I work hard and, um, you know, it's really been a blessing for me as well as my family um, to be able yeah. to do that. That's um, awesome. I'm, I'm very yeah. thankful. For no, that. I think I think that's the key. Is like you got to. I mean, I learned a long time ago that people in the scrap industry don't usually want to hear about the scrap industry. Yeah, that's so <laughs> friends, family. You know, like I'm like. So I think you have to at some point you have to just kind of cut it off. And it's not to say like, look, my wife would happily if I, if I had something to talk to her about. Of course you can, but like also at a certain point you just want to like. Yeah, you just want to separate those yeah. two things, which I think is is good. And like my kids don't want to hear about scrap all the time. <laughs> um, I mean, that's just what it is. So you, you just got to do have a little bit of separation. It's hard, though. I mean, look, we get calls at, at all hours. I and mean, yep. for for us now, we've got a trader on the West Coast. So like I even underestimated the difference, um, you know, for that three hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. and it's not on him. Like if it's if it's uh, seven o'clock our time, it's four o'clock his time. Sure. You know, he needs me for something it's totally fine like like that's just how life is but we just we do our best yeah. uh, maybe a couple secret texts at the dinner table whatever we got to do but uh do no but but it's good i think we found a we found a good way to uh to balance it and, and in the end uh you know like you know you just got to shut you, you, the problem's going to be there tomorrow <laughs> so you know you, you try to get a good night's sleep and and try to focus like for me i i have three kids and my job in the morning my wife's a teacher she's out early Mm -hmm. um, so I got to get my kids ready. So I, I get up early. I check the markets. I'll see what's going on. And then I'm in full dad mode until I drop them off. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I got to be focused on them. Uh, obviously, I'm thinking about, you know, what's going on. Will Saad sell me siding today? <laughs> or whatever, whatever is coming up for the day. Um, but yeah, you just got to you just got to try to like, you know, kind of keep those two worlds a little bit separate. Yeah, yeah. gotcha. Uh, I kind of had a question going back like to the metals industry. Like right now, like with them raising interest rates and stuff, and uh, us kind of being in this like recessionary uh, cycle that we're in right now, would you say it's kind of uh, more difficult on your side of the business, like right now during like a recession type of a thing, or like kind of does it say the same when the economy is doing good? And when um, it's bad? Or like yeah, yeah no, it's a good like, question. So yeah. I think I think like what we saw is in the in like November, December, January. Um, the supply was was just so low that even though the cost of money is going up, so you think in theory we can we can we can make we can we should be able to widen our margin because our cost of money in the last year and a half has tripled, mm -hmm. um, which is crazy. Wow. Um, because it's so competitive, because there's not a lot of supply out there, everyone's you know all the brokers, everyone we're competing with is fighting for the same amount. So your margins are tight. And you just gotta you know you need the volume going through. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think this business is is a is a good business. Good and bad times. I mean, you know, the the fluctuation is. I mean, we've seen some dark times, so I got to be careful. I don't want to say this too much, but I think it's. I don't ever want to say it's it's recession proof because it's certainly not. But I think it's it's pretty good as far as uh, you know. You, you, there's always metal to buy. There's always mm -hmm. things going on. I mean, obviously, again, when COVID was a different. Like, let's let's yep. take that chunk out of it. But yeah. generally, in, in in normal life, it's it's um, it's pretty good. I mean, I think with with rates up, um, it it changes a lot. What we've had to have sessions with our traders is in is in talking about the cost of money and how how big of a deal it becomes you know again like the the rates of um, the cost of money has tripled so i mean just you know giving them the lessons to understand okay somebody wants um payment terms in seven days our you know our standard payment terms are 21 days which wow. is is better than most most brokers um shout out to us uh, <laughs> but but you know if someone wants a deal in seven days what what does that mean for us i mean what does that mean for our business that that extra time and, and our controller is like, you know, obviously he looks at it as like, you know, that's that's the money. That's where you can you don't even know if you're a trader, if you don't understand every day, if you buy a fifty thousand dollar load and you're paying it out 14 days quicker, that costs of money. I mean, you know, whatever, it's a couple hundred dollars there that you're talking about mm -hmm. that right there that can make the big difference. So um, I think it's 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 changing. And for me, it's been a little bit of a learning curve because since I started the business, really rates have been, money's been cheap. Mm -hmm. So it's been a little bit of a learning curve to start looking at it that way and saying like, okay, like, well now, um, you know, we've got access to capital, which is great, but we have to be smart about it because, you know, it's, it costs you a lot more money than it used to, yeah. to do it. But, but we also see that factor in like we were saying, 
there's some yards that will sell that will sell openly knowing what you're making because what they care about is they need cash flow coming in so that they can go and buy copper over the scale. Okay. Um, so they'll give up a couple pennies to do quick cash. So it's we've got to, we've had to change a little bit the way we think, um, but I think I think it's I think the business is still strong. Um, I mean, I think there's a ton of opportunity coming sure. up, even with mm-hmm. with the cost of money being up. I just think I mean the way, the way things have gone, and and even the way I've seen our business change from just being domestic to being a worldwide kind of business um i just think there's there's a lot of opportunity whether it's you know here or there sometimes it makes sense to ship something overseas um there's there's tons of opportunity out there for sure where do you where do you guys kind of see compass metal being in the next five to ten years maybe like have you guys thought about like kind of the long term goals? yeah yeah i mean like we i think i think look we, we we're we're gonna try to have a couple of uh physical yards um but not like i mean i think we, we maybe some some small feeder yards because we've I like I think a lot of us grew up in the yard business. We like it, mm-hmm. so if the right opportunities come, we're going to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're going to continue growing on the trading front, especially on the international side. Um, I think that there's there's more and more. I, I don't know exactly what that looks like, because we'll we'll see if it means having employees overseas or overseas or what we do. But um, yeah, I think I think there's there's just it's almost a, it's almost a thing where there's so much opportunity um, mm-hmm. that it's it's picking what makes sense and what you want to do because. The other part of it is like, I mean, we, I mean, I'll speak for me, but I think Phil, you also are like this. We enjoy what we do. Yeah. So we, we want to grow, but we also want to keep enjoying what we're doing. Right? right. I mean, there's no sense in working as hard as we work and hating it. Mm-hmm. So we want to grow, but we want to grow with things that we're interested in and mm-hmm. things that like motivate us. So we're just trying to find those opportunities that we're like, think like, okay, this is not just like, you know, we all know in this business is not like, it's hard to make money. I mean, there's, yeah. it's not an easy, margins are, are tight. There's a lot of competition. So anything you go, you want to go into, I think it's important that you really are like interested in it. You have a passion for it that you want to go and, and, and make it work. For sure. Yeah, sure. Well, do you have any, like, I know you, like, do you ever think you would be like owning a business at all like this? Or like, like yeah, I mean, uh, so, so the, the joke that my wife says, because Basically, when I tried to get her to move to Canada and then it ended up not working and me being here is like, that's how this opportunity came up. Yeah. Um, and like, yeah, I mean, I don't, I didn't, I don't know. I guess I never thought of it. Mm-hmm. I think, I think it's just been so busy. It's such a blur. Like I just look at it as like between, um, you know, like you guys know how it is. You work in the, you're working so much. Like I was, when I was running the yard, I was working six days a week. I was working whatever hours I had to work. Mm-hmm. Um, so you just, I didn't even think of it. I mean, I think I'm, Maybe maybe it's like an ignorance is bliss that like even when I got into the opportunity I didn't uh, I didn't even think it was a, like I was just like okay this is the next thing I'm gonna go and do it yeah. um, I definitely I mean I, I definitely had a moment because it, it took a long time to really get the business flourishing uh, and I remember having a moment maybe two weeks in sitting in Toronto with with our CEO and just like you know he said to me he's like did you think this was gonna be easy and I was like yeah. I didn't. Like, like that's like I don't know. I'm like I just I thought it would be a lot easier, and, and it was and it was hard. So I mean, uh, I guess I never thought I would. You know, I never thought of myself as 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 doing it. But it's come like being being a, an owner of a business. But it's it's come naturally. I think just yeah. over time. And, and what we were talking about before is just I learned all the facets of the business, so it made it that much easier. I think the hardest leap I've had to make was, you know, our our finance was was handled by our parent company for a long time. Okay. When we hired our own. Our, our, you know, at the time, senior accountant, who's now our controller, and now we've got another accountant. The biggest leap for me was before that I had done all the jobs within the company. You know, I'd I'd book trucks, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd done settlements, I'd done everything within the company. That was like the hardest thing for me yeah. to be like, trust I don't, yeah, trust somebody else because I have to trust that he's doing his job right. I mean, I. Mm-hmm. I did a business degree. I know a little bit about accounting, but I'm not an accountant. So uh, that that was the hardest the hardest leap in all of it. Um, I've learned a lot, and uh, and it's also I, I think I've come to the point where we've hired great traders that have come on and, and, and made it easy. That you know now like Phil's doing deals with people that I don't even know about, and that that to me is the most satisfying part of the business is when when deals are happening, when things are happening, and I'm not even involved. I'm like it's, it's like the best feeling in the world. Or even better when there's a problem and you don't have to get involved. and I don't have to get involved. It's like the best feeling in the world because I mean, in the end, I think if you hire good people and you just give them the freedom, 
um, to, to do their jobs. I mean, it's, it's really not that crazy. You're just there to, to guide. And then sometimes you have to, you have to get involved if, if things get really tough or they, there's bad situations. But other than that, it's, it's, it's not so bad. So it comes with being a good leader. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I think you guys are, are very lucky. I mean, I think Dan is, uh, is 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 great. I mean, I can tell you that Dan was one of the first people that I bought material from. Um, he was super welcoming when I came to visit, and and again, not everyone was because you're you're. I was just like this guy coming in. I just moved here from Canada. And sell me <laughs> sell me a load of aluminum. So I think Dan might have been like I don't know where he is on the list, but he's up there. So I always wow. uh, he's always got a special place for me. I wish he still more often because i know you guys hold a lot yeah. um, but but uh but yeah i mean i think i think it's important and you guys have a great great team and a great leader i mean it makes a big difference yeah well one one final thing i kind of thought of um kind of your how do you feel like social media kind of with your company is is uh evolving i know you guys are both on linkedin do you, do you think that's a good tool for for your company and uh yeah. I mean, I, th I, I love it. You know, um, I think in terms of overall exposure, in terms of, um, you know, content, you know, that's valuable. It, 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 it hits a different demographic yeah. than, let's say, you know, uh, an older generation. Now, the, what we're seeing, obviously, in terms of the overall industry is that the uh, older people um, are retiring and the, yeah. the younger generation is now coming in. So in order to be able to connect and um, you know, communicate with those people, um, it's just, it, it, we've, we've gone from you know, the traditional Rolodex phone call, you know, fax kind of business to now obviously a more digital platform. And being able to be versatile um, and um, you know, uh, accept that and, and uh, adopt it and you know use it as a tool uh i think brings a lot of value especially for our business i love linkedin yeah. um uh, i love you know instagram uh i probably am on it way too much to be honest with you but um <laughs> the real, yeah on the reels a lot, or, or yeah, yeah you, you kind of you know there might be some brainwashing in there somewhere <laughs> yeah, <that's> somewhere <laughs> somewhere around there but um no i i think it brings a lot of value and i think that um you know, keeping a presence, you know, that obviously doesn't uh, confuse your viewership uh, and just, you know, brings your point across and what you're all about um, is extremely important. And I think you guys did that today. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. Appreciate that. Appreciate your message as well. And uh, yeah, we just appreciate you guys yeah, coming in. Absolutely. It. So it's a pleasure yeah, having we, us. We, we, we're, truly, we're truly fans. No, no, no BS. We like yes. what you guys are doing. I think there's a lot of people doing good stuff. I mean, on, I, I think we're we're the older generation of the. It's hard. It's hard. Like I I, 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 I talked to. Uh, I think I might have, maybe might have done the the podcast to, to Jennifer Betts. Oh, Jennifer. And I, I mean, I think her content is great. And I mean, yeah. I, I had a call with her, and I was telling her it's it's hard for me. I mean, I'm 40 years old, and I'm like, I'm not. I just don't want to do TikTok videos because I'm like, yeah. I, like, I think it's great, but I mean, it's just not my thing. But I love the social media. What we try to do is 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 like, I mean, we've used Instagram. More than LinkedIn, I think I think we've gotten a lot of customers. It's more, more even just building the network. I think, mm -hmm. um, and like you, you kind of like build relationships with different people. I'm sure you guys have found that oh, yeah. different yeah. people that are posting. I think um, we so, met Jennifer through TikTok. Yep. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so I mean, no, it's it, it's great. I think what you guys are doing is awesome. I think we're gonna see more and more people, and probably more more copycats, maybe like a Carrie Frick 2.0 <laughs> somewhere else. That's trying to do. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's great. Just keep keep doing your thing, and, and hopefully. Uh, you know, I think it hope, hopefully it helps with the, the whole outlook and how people view our industry. I think that's the biggest thing. And that's what's going to draw the talent. In. There you go. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so yes, much. Yes, absolutely. Appreciate it. Great it was our job. pleasure. Hopefully you can get back in the dumpster soon. I, I uh, think that we'll have to make that happen. If I get in a dumpster anytime soon, it's probably because I'm going to be climbing in it, looking through material. <laughs> We're trying to find something good to take out of there. For sure. Yeah. Well, hopefully it's this dumpster. Yeah, fair, nice, enough, fair enough. Well, thank you guys. We yeah. really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Take care.